welcome to hello welcome to fertility factor fiction i am your host dr rahi victory i am a board certified reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist and tonight we have a very special guest we have Corey Ruth from the Women's Dietitian, an amazing social media um, uh, resource for everyone. And she is joining us live and uh, we're gonna ask her all about uh, what she does and her interest in PCOS. So if you have questions, feel free to post them and um, hopefully we'll get a chance to answer. She is with us for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna take your questions live uh, for, for our normal program on the show. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. This is really a, an honor and uh, I love your social media posts. They're amazing. I watch them pretty much all the time. So you've done such a great job with that. It's been uh, absolutely incredible. Tell me a little bit about how you actually got into the social media part of things and, and into dietitian and, and into uh, PCOS especially. Sure. So I, I'm a registered dietitian and I went to school to get my master's in nutritional science after my, my bachelor degree. And I thought, you know, um, I would love to open a private practice one day, I'd do my own thing. You know, working in hospitals is great and working in food service is great, but I kind of want to expand. And I, the one thing I said I never wanted to go into was PCOS because it's so complex. Yeah, I have PCOS too, so I kind of had my own journal journey and struggles with the condition. So um, I decided to kind of, I wanted to work with women's health in some capacity. And as I got into things, I started to notice that, you know what, there's such a huge connection between diet and nutrition and what and how we're eating and PCOS. Yeah. I'm the perfect person, you know, here I am a registered dietitian with PCOS and I have clinical experience. I work in a women's clinic alongside some really fantastic, very talented OBGYNs back in the day. And so I, I decided to go for it and I never went back. I absolutely love what I did. Cool. So did you actually go off and open up your own clinical space and then do the social media or were they sort of hand in hand? The social media part. No, um, I I was virtual from day one. Just oh, okay. I just wanted an Instagram page, and I thought, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'll just I'll just go for it. And it really just kind of blew up. You know, it just expanded very quickly, and lots of women wanting and needing help and guidance when it comes to diet and PCOS. And so, um, it just has grown since then. I started the page in twenty uh, late twenty eighteen, and then I opened oh, wow. up my practice around that time. Wow. And then the growth has been really explosive. Obviously, you've been doing great. That's so amazing. Great, yeah. uh, great background story there. So in your in your view of things, especially surfing on online and, and going through all the social media stuff, what do you think are the biggest dietary myths about PCOS? Because clinically, you know, pretty much every day we hear people coming in saying, I'm not eating badly. I'm really trying to watch my diet, but I can't lose the weight. Um, it's a real struggle. And, and, you know, with no dietetic background, I don't necessarily have all the right answers for them. So what are some of the myths that, that you hear a lot of and, and that people should kind of avoid? Sure. So one of the biggest myths that's perpetuated with diet and PCOS is that you have to, you should eliminate gluten and dairy. Uh -huh. We just don't have the research that says everyone with PCOS should and must go gluten and dairy free. Um, okay. The only exception there is we do have some studies on dairy exacerbating pre-existing acne. So not that dairy will cause it if it didn't exist before, but if you suffer with severe cystic acne, eliminating dairy may be helpful for you. Right. So, um, you know, with, with eliminating gluten and dairy, it's, it's, it's hard to do that. It can be restrictive and, you know, you're, but on the, on the other side of things, you know, all of a sudden you're paying attention to food labels, right? If you're eating out at a restaurant, your options are drastically reduced. Right. So you're probably going to go for the lower carb protein rich item anyway. So really with PCOS and diet, you can make all foods work. 
Um, it's just a matter of how much and when. So that's one of the biggest myths out there. Um, another one is to uh, go keto. You know, keto, we do have research that true ketosis can be helpful for conditions like PCOS, insulin resistance, diabetes. However, going, being in ketosis, true ketosis and going keto is really hard to maintain long term. Right. So that's not something that I recommend because again, you know, PCOS is something that we, we can struggle with for life. So we need something that's going to be sustainable, something that's going to work for us long term. So instead of, you know, eliminating things, I teach women with PCOS how to make all of the things that they like to eat work better for them and their PCOS. Um, and then the other one that I hear a lot is, you know, just cut carbs. Lots about, you know, lo lots of women hearing that, um, you know, and it's, you don't have to eliminate all carbohydrates. That's really hard yeah, to do. Yeah. And keto, difficult to do. So it's just a matter of paring these things down and focusing more on protein, fat, and fiber. So, so is there, are there particular sort of proteins that you recommend women focus on? Like, does it matter if it's plant-based or animal-based or, or even protein powder? Like, where do you, where do you tell people to sort of focus for their proteins? Yeah, you can, you can really have any of the protein sources available. Sometimes with plant-based proteins, they do um, include some of them. They can include more carbohydrates, like for example, beans. Right. great source of protein, but also really high in carbohydrates. So right. I'm not a big advocate of going, you know, full strict vegetarian or vegan for PCOS. Not that eating more plants isn't great, but in terms of blood sugar balance, it definitely can be helpful to include proteins that aren't also carbohydrate heavy, like right. seafood, you know, fish, um, meats, um, protein powders are, are great depending on the, the brand and the type, right? There's all kinds out there. Um, but protein powders can be a great, really easy way to get to up your protein levels without adding a bunch of carbs and added sugars and, um, and calories. So that's a good one too. Awesome. So as far as some of your best PCOS sort of recommendations in general, mm -hmm. um, wh where do you start off when you're counseling your clients? Because obviously they're facing all these myths that are out there. Like you said, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled that you mentioned the gluten and the dairy because I see that every day. Yes. Um, you know, people saying abandon gluten, abandon dairy for infertility in general, let alone for, um, you know, PCOS. And, and, and I'm like you, I mean, I think it's kind of irrational to tell people to just stop eating huge categories of food. Cause like you said, it's not really sustainable. So, um, do you have sort of a, a basic plan or, or idea of what you tell people? These are the areas to focus on and these are where you're going to net the most benefit, um, for your, your PCOS journey. And I guess aside, along with that, my other question would be, um, you know, what do you recommend for those that need to lose weight as part of their PCOS? Because obviously not every PCOS woman has weight loss as an issue. Right. But for those that do, um, you know, what, what kind of balance do you tell them to strike? And do you include exercise in it? Or is it focused mainly on the diet? Those, those sorts of things would be great to hear about. Totally. So when it comes to, we'll kind of start with the nutrition and just kind of the foundation of nutrition for PCOS. It's really all about blood sugar balance. So blood sugar and PCOS, they're really intricately connected. And, right. you know, you're at least here in the US, uh, maybe more so than where you are, but we live in just a very carb centric food society. You know, it's, um, we say we go out to dinner and we get like breadsticks or rolls or tortilla chips for an appetizer, you know, when we get to the table and then maybe we do a pasta with a little bit, tiny little bit of vegetable in there, maybe, maybe a meat, maybe a protein. We get a cocktail, you know, we get a side salad with croutons, we get a dessert. It's, you know, we're kind of carb, 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 carb. And right. the best way to make positive strides when it comes to PCOS and diet is really focusing on that blood sugar balance. So not eliminating carbohydrates, but making sure you're getting in a ton of protein and fiber and healthy fats, um, saturated fats. We need those too. So, um, so that's really the, the kind of the foundation of that. And, um, you know, we can get into more specifics there, but, 
um, just by working on paring down how many carbs we're having, um, how much, the portion size, and how we're eating them. So for an example, um, we like to kind of, we like to have our carbs paired with a protein if we can. So if we're having a, you know, typically we just grab a banana as a snack, you know, or maybe we grab that and, and run out the door for breakfast. We want to be adding some protein to that because it, what it does is it helps negate the blood sugar spike from that banana that you would otherwise have. So okay. if you add some peanut butter to that, that's going to be happy. Your blood sugar is going to be a lot happier if you do that. So we don't have to just banish all bananas and say, I'm never going to eat banana again. But maybe, you know, you add that peanut butter to it and, and that way your blood sugar is in a much better place. So that has, um, you know, the connection is, is huge, but it's not always so clear, you know, especially when you're, you're just researching, you know, PCOS and diet, what do I do? And so, um, so the blood sugar connection is huge. And then in terms of adding other things, um, exercise can super be super helpful when it comes to that blood sugar standpoint as well. Yeah. So, you know, just by adding in some movement, you don't need to become an Olympic athlete. You know, you don't need to go run a marathon, but just by adding in some movement a few times a week, that can really help with blood sugar too. Um, and also there's a huge stress connection. So um, a lot of us with PCOS are kind of um, more prone to stress as right. far as impacting uh, ovulation. And, you know, when it comes to the fertility connection, as you know, as a lot of us know, PCOS um, the reason why it's such a huge contributor to infertility is because a lot of us either ovulate irregularly or we're not ovulating at all. So, um, so that stress connection can be so real. Just working on stress management, whether that means adding in some movement, um, you know, adding in some extra self-care practices, making sure you're sleeping well. That stress connection can be so huge when it comes to making sure that you're ovulating more consistently which sets you up, you know, for, for a better chance when it comes to conception. So you, there's all kinds of, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, do you find that the nutrition and the stress are also linked together? Like, do you find that your clients have less stress when they're improving their nutrition? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Blood sugar, you know, cortisol, which is our stress hormone, they're all connected. And, you know, we just kind of, we feel better when we're eating well, you know, when we're sleeping better, um, you know, when we're not as bloated or fatigued, that, that all helps our stress levels. Um, so I would say definitely there's a huge connection there. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, and what do you do with the patients that have seen uh, a physician like me or an RE and they've been told, mm -hmm you know, just go on metformin and letrozole. Like I always counsel our patients uh, on our shows that PCOS really has three different elements. There's the uh, medical part of it, which is, you know, the medic medications that we use. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a natural part of it where we use a lot of supplements like inositol and NAC and coenzyme Q10, mm -hmm. uh, some resveratrol. And then there's the, what I call the lifestyle component. Um, and I probably should call the, the nutrition component now having spoken to you, <laughs> where we tell them about what kind of diet to eat, how frequently to eat, and then mm -hmm. the exercise component too. So so are you integrating those other parts into what you're counseling your patients with as well? Or are you more focused kind of just solely on the, the stress and the nutrition? Yeah, well, I not being a medical doctor, you know, it's, um, it's really if what I always say is if a client or, you know, I run PCOS programs, if a program member wants to go that route, I absolutely a thousand percent support that. We all have to figure out what works best for us. But I also want them to know that that's not their only option. And if they want to go that route, there, there are still things that they should be doing lifestyle wise to help optimize their success, right? To help boost their chances if they're trying to get pregnant. So I'll, I'll get the question a lot, like, should I join your, you know, your, your get pregnant with PCOS program, because I'm, I'm actually going to start, um, you know, some Clomid or, or, you know, Famara. And I'll say, yeah, totally, because there's so many things we can do from the nutrition and dietary and lifestyle standpoint to help us boost the success that that medication might otherwise not have had. So the two can really work together and you don't always just have to choose one or the other. Um, you know, the, the two can really coexist very beautifully. Tell me a little bit, you mentioned your, your program. So tell me a little bit about the programs that you offer and kind of how you interact with your, your clients. If, if some of our viewers want to reach out to you for help, 
um, what would they do to, to, you know, see you and get in touch with you? And what are they going to experience? Yeah, so I, I have had two different PCOS programs that have been super successful over the years. And I, I've run them a few times a year. Um, one is Get Pregnant with PCOS, and the other one is the PCOS Boss Academy. So they're focused on PCOS symptom mastery, um, permanent non-restrictive weight loss, and fertility. So I'm kind of combining those two programs. And in April, I'll be opening up what's called the PCOS Thrive Hive. And that is a subscription membership program with a meal plan, exercise plans with a PCOS um, a personal trainer. There's um, access to lab testing discounts. There's um, cycle tracking information for fertility purposes. There's all kinds of stuff. And so that's kind of a, a marriage of the two. And I'll be opening that in the spring. And so um, within that is access to a private membership community where um, I connect with you and you can connect with other women in the program who are kind of on your same journey. One of the most difficult things I think in, in, in a fertility journey is just kind of feeling that isolation, feeling like you're the only one in your friend group struggling. Everyone else is getting coughed on and then they're getting pregnant. Right. And then you're just kind of out here floating and you're looking for help and support. And so it's so nice to have that support system and that tribe and that network. And so um, that's another component of the thrive hive. That's going to, that's going to be very helpful. I think. Super cool. Um, I, I love that idea. I think it's great. And, and I think a lot of women will really appreciate that and feel that there's a, mm -hmm. like you said, there's going to be a community there for them um, mm -hmm. that they can reach out to and get the kind of help and support that they need. So that's amazing. Um, we've tried really hard within our own program to create a really robust um, sort of backup system of psychological well-being and and making sure that the patient's emotional concerns are addressed um, we do have a dietitian but um, you know we're not interacting with them as much as I would like and so you know like I said I kept seeing your stuff and I thought this is a great opportunity to reach out to someone that's doing some really groundbreaking work and and really reaching out to a lot of people successfully so I think that's going to be amazing um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you've seen clinically mm -hmm. with regards to the impact of your dietary changes in terms of women that are, for example, doing insemination or doing IVF, do they mm -hmm. notice an improvement in their egg quality and their embryos, um, you know, their outcomes? Are they seeing like a, a more positive uh, live birth rate? I mean, I'm sure you're not necessarily yeah. measuring those, but do right. they at least anecdotally tell you that that's the case? Yeah, you know, and just backing up a little bit, I get asked a lot, like, well, how, you know, what's your percentage rate for pregnancy in your programs? And I'm like, I trust me, I wish I knew that exact answer. But the reality is, you know, I, I go, I move through hundreds of women in a cohort, and many of them will email me or message me or DM me on Instagram and say, Oh, my gosh, you know, I'm pregnant. Blah, blah. But so many people will tell me like, a year later, later, they'll message me and be like, oh, I had a question about this supplement. Oh, by the way, I just had my baby after I took your program. So thank you for that. I'm like, wait a minute. So, you know, it's so hard to measure exactly the impact that we're having here. But <laughs> um, but as far as your question goes, absolutely. There's so many women who have done multiple rounds of, you know, IUI or IVF. And, you know, they, they take my program, they really implement the changes, they do it well. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're making all these shifts in their diet, and they're managing their blood sugar better, they're supplementing correctly, they're sleeping better. Um, you know, they're managing their stress, they're moving their body. And they'll tell me that, you know, and sometimes I'll get these answers where they'll say, Oh, you know, I had you know, X number of eggs retrieved and, you know, this many that were fertilized. And then this round, I had this many. And so sometimes we can see it play out that way. And that's, that's truly amazing progress, you know, and that's honestly, all of those, all of that feedback, all of the success stories, and I'm sure, you know, is, is what keeps us going. So um, yeah, I absolutely think that you can make an impact. And I know, you know, based on some of the research out there, as far as what we're eating and how different, you know, lifestyle choices that we're making can really impact egg quality, can impact sperm health, all the things. So, yeah, I, I, I'd say definitely as a fertility specialist, what I mm -hmm. see a lot 
is that the other fertility centers really don't pay attention to those nuances. They're not focused on the psychological well-being or the nutritional component or the exercise. And it's mm -hmm. all just kind of let's do more IVF. And I've never been a proponent of just telling people to do more IVF. We really believe in a more holistic approach. So mm -hmm. I love the mm -hmm. fact that you've made that available for people and that they are seeing benefits from doing it. Certainly for anyone watching, um, it is critically important that you have balance when you're approaching fertility. It's not just about getting a medical treatment that's going to solve all the problems because oftentimes it's not enough. You actually need more mm -hmm. components to it and, and nutrition is definitely one of them for sure. You mentioned supplements. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I wasn't mistaken when I was flipping through some of your posts, you actually have your own line of supplements. Is that right? I do. Yes. Yeah. That's super cool. So tell me a little bit about that because I've been tinkering with the idea of making some fertility supplements as well, but I'd love to hear yeah. about your PCOS supplements. So tell us all about that. Totally. So supplements are, I always lead with this, supplements are one piece of the puzzle, right? There's many pieces and it's so funny whenever I do like a, if I do an Instagram post and I give five different, you know, top strategies for, um, whatever, um, you know, uh, making sure you're ovulating or, you know, getting ovulation back on track. Maybe I'll list one supplement and I swear to God, 200 comments about just the supplement. So I get it. You know, I, I get it. Like everyone wants to have that magic cure, right? That magic fix, but PCOS and well, I should say supplements there, there's no magic cure. Um, PCOS supplements are one part of the puzzle. They're a very important piece, but I just want to lead with that because, um, you know, we have to be doing other things alongside supplementation. So, um, the supplement line that I created is called Vita PCOS. And, um, I'll just talk about a couple of the, the best sellers. One of them is the, probably my top seller is the androgen blocker, um, Energy Blocker has kind of this little cult following now, um, which is really awesome. But it basically, it's got things like zinc and saw palmetto and pygium and nettles. And these things can be helpful for, um, for healthy androgen balance. And many women with PCOS, not all of us, but many of us struggled with things like elevated testosterone or DHT or DHEA. So, um, so that helps to encourage lower levels. And, um, and it's a great one if you're struggling with facial hair, um, you know, body hair growth, hair loss on the head, acne, weight gain. It's a really wonderful one. Um, and the other one that I love is called the cortisol calmer. And that's the other one that's super popular, has a little bit of a cult following. Um, and it's a really calming formula. It's great for sleep and stress support. Women of PCOS are at a three times higher risk for things like anxiety and depression. Um, so we really, and we really want to be focusing on stress management and the cortisol calmer has different adaptogens. It has phosphatidylserine. It's just a really lovely blend. And so many of us take it, um, in the evening as we're getting ready for bed and it helps to encourage better sleep, um, and just kind of better mood. So it, that's a really great one too. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I know you've got to go soon. Um, so uh, just tell me what your favorite recipe is before you go. And, uh, you know, as far as like the best PCOS recipe for maybe a, a meal mm -hmm. and a snack. And that way our viewers will have something to uh, to take with them away from this. And then let us know yeah. what the easiest way for um, anyone who wants to reach out to you to get a hold of you is. Sure. Um, so I have, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> um, I obviously am a huge food nerd, so that's tough. I'm going to just, just tell you one that I made recently that I've made a million times and I absolutely love it. And it will turn anyone who's not an eggplant fan into an eggplant lover because it's eggplant pizza basically. So you cut the eggplant into rounds, like thin rounds and you, put some pizza sauce, some cheese, some pepperoni, whatever you want, and then you bake them and like broil the cheese. And it, it is so satisfying. You feel like you're just eating a ton of pizza, but it's, you know, it's got a lot of fiber 
and other antioxidants, um, you know, from the eggplant in there. So I love that one. I make it all the time. It's like a, almost like a weekly thing around here. Um, and I love that for PCOS because we get that protein, you know, we get that fiber and, um, you know, we're not, we're not overdoing it on the carbohydrate intake, but we're still really satisfied. You never walk away from eating that meal and feel like you're hungry. So I love that one. Um, I also have a huge sweet tooth. So if you have, if you're looking for PCOS recipes, yeah, um, on my Instagram page, I have a highlight with almost 100 recipes. Um, and I update it every week with new recipes. So people always ask me if I'm going to create a cookbook and I'm like, maybe, but honestly, just go to my recipes highlight because it has just as many recipes as you would find in a cookbook. And they're all supportive of PCOS, fertility and healthy weight loss. So, um, yeah, definitely check that out. And then um, where you can find me, I'm most active on my Instagram, which is at the women's dietitian. Dietitian, it's spelled with two T's and not a C. Um, and also uh, my website is thewomensdietitian.com. I'm also on TikTok, but um, I need to be better about TikTok. So I'm not on there as much, but the same handle, the women's dietitian. Um, and then I think that's probably... The best, yeah, probably Instagram is the best way to reach me. I'm I'm always available by DM. I run the account by myself. I don't have a team. So I love to interact with all of my followers and everybody on there. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. That's amazing. Well, listen, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. Uh, really honored to have you on. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance to bring you back on in a, a couple of months. And, uh, you know, I'm sure patients will have questions that they'll want to ask you. Um, I know we had a bit of a time crunch this time, but we'll find a, a better time where uh, there's a little more time so people that want to ask you questions can get a chance to ask them as well. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight and uh, amazing, amazing work. I'll keep watching you on uh, social media. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your incredible work too. You're a wonderful resource to point clients to. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Have a great night. All right. All right. Take care. Okay, well, um, amazing, amazing uh, work from the women's dietitian, uh, Corey Ruth. So uh, she's got a phenomenal page. If you get a chance to look her up on Instagram, check her out. Um, always very bubbly and, and uh, it's like a really attractive uh, Instagram page because she just kind of sucks you in and, and you want to really watch her and see how um, she's doing things. So, uh, and there are lots of recipes there, <clears throat> including some that have chocolate, which is probably the reason it caught my eye to begin with. So, um, amazing work from her. I love her to bits. Um, very smart lady knows her stuff inside out and backwards. So, uh, really enjoyed that opportunity to talk with her. And if you need, um, anything from her, reach out there. So um, I think we can take some questions. We actually have a comment, but I'm not quite sure how it was aimed. So Gloria on TikTok says, it hurts when you go through all this and put out all that money and still no baby. So um, you know what? Um, I think I'll comment on that because I think that that's a very, very, very valid point. Um, there is a lot of trauma that comes with infertility. So we have a, a YouTube video where we spoke with Dr. Julia Sen, who has a PhD in fertility psychology. And Dr. Sen talks about the fact that even after you're successful, there's still trauma. Even when you look at your baby, there's still trauma, let alone when you're not successful. Infertility is hard and it's traumatizing. It's a loss of control. Um, it's not, you know, the natural thing people want. And so it can really leave a mark. And when you add a financial trauma to that mental and emotional and, you know, spiritual trauma, it can really kind of burst the dam. It, it can be a little overwhelming for people. And so there is definitely a, a difficult point that people reach. And it's really critical that you work with a team that's ready to address that. So, you know, in our program, we've got a psychologist, we've got a social worker, we've got Dr. Sen, um, you know, we've got the dietitian, and, and we try and reach out to people who can help. We even have an online program because you're right it does suck like there's no way to sugarcoat that um, it's hard to go through this and not have a successful outcome and then look at it and go oh my god i spent all this money and i still don't have a baby out of it and it's even worse 
if you're somewhere um, where I'll leave it nameless, but if you're in a, a country or a city where the infertility is even more expensive, that's even worse, right? So because now you not only have to pay a lot for the treatment, you're paying even more than other people are paying. And that can be really horrifically unfair. Like, how is it possibly fair that, you know, I'm providing treatment at X number of dollars and across the river, somebody's, you know, paying double or even triple sometimes what we charge for the exact same therapy. Arguably, it's much better here. So, yeah, I get it. Um, it's not fair, Gloria. So um, I get the fact that it's terrible. Um, she's talking about, she's mentioning now the diet. Um, I get that too. Um, the diet can be hard. Um, and buying all these supplements and sticking to a strict diet makes it extra hard. But it is an important part. The diet um, is important for weight loss. It's important for blood sugar control. And, um, and uh, Corey spoke about that today. Um, it's important for inflammation. We know that people that have high insulin levels uh, and a lot of sugar in their system have high inflammation levels and inflammation is definitely not fertility's friend. So um, I get it. It's definitely difficult. There's no easy part to infertility. Um, but you know what? We're there for you. And if you're with us, we're definitely there for you. If you are with um, another facility, make sure they're there for you. And if they're not, then find someone who will be. Because um, a lot of fertility centers do care and we are uh, set up to help you. So reach out if we can be of service and, and that's what we're there for. It's not all just about pushing people through IVF. It's about helping people and, and helping them sometimes means holding their hand, walking them through it, giving them advice, giving you options. So um, there's a lot that can you know be there for you to help you out. <clears throat> Ready? I'm ready. We might even be done early because we're starting like early because of the half hour ahead of time. Yeah. Is there any bad side to using IVF to choose the sex of baby? And could a good fertility clinic do it with freezed sperm? And does Adderall affect sperm quality? Okay. So is there a bad side? I mean, there is a theoretical risk to PGTA, which is what you need if you're trying to do sex selection. Um, where the embryos can get damaged. It's very rare. Um, I don't think it's something that happens commonly. In our program, it's happened less than 1%, so I'm not worried about that at all. Um, so probably not a major factor that you're worried about damaging anything. Um, from the standpoint of uh, can it be done? Yes, it can easily be done. That's not an issue. From the standpoint of using frozen sperm, yes, of course, it can be done with frozen sperm. It's not as good as fresh, but it can be done with frozen sperm. The last question is Adderall. So I don't know of any specific studies with regards to Adderall and sperm, but I can tell you that we've had women as egg donors on Adderall and the egg quality is not good. So I would anticipate it likely has some impact on the sperm as well. So as a result of that, I would be very, very cautious about Adderall. If you can avoid it, I would avoid it. It does not make a lot of sense to be using a stimulant drug like that when you are trying to conceive. So I would avoid that. Now, having said all of that, in Canada, you cannot choose the sex of the baby. It is 100% illegal. We can't even facilitate helping to choose the sex of the baby. So even if you wanted to go to the US to do it, we can't monitor you here. We can't provide you treatment here. The only time we're allowed to do it is if there is a genetically linked, um, sex linked condition. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy or something like that, then we can, but otherwise we cannot. Do I recommend to people that they go for sex selection? No. So someone I know very well um, in town here uh, tried sex selection, not once, but twice, um, spent an enormous amount of money and it didn't work. They actually failed their IVF. So I would be very, very, very cautious about doing sex selection. We do not recommend it. We do not support it. And when patients come in asking for it, I tell them flat out, I cannot help you because we can't. So I'm happy to answer the technical questions, but legally in Canada, we cannot provide it to anyone. No one will provide that to you. And if they are, um, not only are they breaking the law, you're actually breaking Canadian law by pursuing it. So 
I would very, very strongly advocate for not pursuing sex selection if you're in Canada. If you're outside of Canada, do whatever you like. I still don't recommend it. I think people should just get whatever they're gonna get because you're gonna love your baby regardless of whether it's a boy or a girl. So, um, and these days, less and less we have boys and girls. Gender seems to be more and more fluid all the time. So um, I don't think that it makes a huge difference. Just take what you're given. Hi, Dr. Victory. Do you practice in the USA or only Canada? <clears throat> um, our facility is in Canada, but um, I am licensed in the USA. So we have a lot of patients that come to us from the States because we are literally right across the river from the, the US. So it's, it's a, like you hop on a bridge and you're here in five minutes. So it's very easy to get here. So yeah, we take care of a lot of American patients, um, but the facility itself is in Canada. We're planning to open up in the US, but um, that's gonna take some time. So we're working on it. Need to lose weight before FET. Thoughts about Ozempic? Um, yeah, I'm not a believer in telling people to take medication to lose weight. Weight loss is actually remarkably simple. It's input and it's output. So it's how many calories you take in and how many calories you burn off. And people always try and make it complicated, but the reality is, yes, there are some fluctuations in insulin levels and blood sugar and and steroids and things like that. And, and I totally respect that. And that's where a dietitian like Corey comes in very, very, very handy. But nevertheless, if you're taking in 1300 calories and you're burning off 2000 calories, it is physically impossible not to lose weight. So you don't need medication. You need discipline and you need exercise and you need a diet that works for you. So I don't believe in telling people to go you know, take medications. We've had different things. Ozempic's the new one. There was one before that, I can't even remember the name. Um, they found out after a while I was giving people permanent pulmonary hypertension, which can be lethal. So you don't wanna be doing that. That does not make sense. Focus on how you can get healthy on your own because you're gonna establish the habits that are gonna stay with you and keep you healthy. Ozempic is not a habit. So don't use Ozempic or, or any other medication like that. And apparently it's causing something called ozempic face that was on the news yesterday. Like people are getting wrinkles in their face from using ozempic. So I would be very cautious. All medications have some side effect. It could be baby aspirin. It could be Tylenol. Um, it could be a vitamin. Medications all have some side effects. So medications are not the answer. You know what doesn't have side effects? Exercise and dieting. There's literally no side effect to that other than benefits. So um, you need to be cautious and follow the right things to do. That's why I drink honey. That's why you drink honey? Yeah, no side effects. No. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be talking to Corey Ruth afterwards because I don't think he was listening <laughs> on everything that was said there, yeah. Um, can you have PCOS and still have a regular period yeah. and regular ovulation? Yeah. So we talk about this on our show all the time. There are criteria for PCOS. And for some weird reason, the fertility societies all want us to strictly adhere to these criteria. But the reality is, I personally believe we're missing the boat. PCOS is a spectrum, right? So you can have something really mild where your periods are slightly irregular or your ovaries just look PCOS on ultrasound. Um, and then you can have the whole other spectrum where the women basically are turning into men. Central adiposity, you know, balding on their head, uh, a full beard, um, they've got weight gain, they're at risk for diabetes, uh, you know, oily skin and so on and so forth. So um, bad acne, all of those things. So uh, all of that is polarized. But in the middle is this vast group of every variation. So yes, you can have PCOS sort of tendencies. I won't call it the disease, but you can have PCOS type tendencies without having the full blown, I don't regularly ovulate. Yeah, and we see that all the time and they still merit the same attention and care that people that have the full blown kind of, um, you know, diagnostic criteria PCOS do. 
Same question as someone else on Ozempic, a good quick option to lose a few pounds before FET, if it's okay, and how long do you need to be off? <clears throat> no, don't do that. No one knows what the impact is before FET, so please don't use Ozempic. Diet, exercise, diet, exercise. You can do it. I mean, they made whole shows about it, right? What was that called? The Biggest, the biggest Loser? The Biggest Loser. Yeah, those people were losing like hundreds of pounds in, you know, months. So it's doable. And, and most of you don't need to lose 100 pounds. So, uh, look, I gained a ton of weight, free admission. Tark was joking about it with me, and, and I was joking about it with him. I gained a ton of weight recently, so I probably need to lose 15 or 20 pounds. I'm already down eight. How? I cut out a lot of carbs. I started exercising again. My weight's going down again. So, um, and I've stopped eating the chocolate. They cleared it off my back desk there. <laughs> I actually yeah. bought new uh, pants. You bought new pants. You fit into new pants. You mean no, too big? Too big. <laughs> I bought bigger pants. Good. Yeah, and that's my limit because I do like my clothing. I know you guys see me in scrubs, but Tark and I actually like clothing. Um, so uh, I am not buying a new wardrobe. There is no way I am doing that. I like my clothing the way they are. Yeah. So so diet and exercise. Do not use those Ozempic. Do not find some magic pill that's going to help you. It's not. You know, Corey was just talking about that. And I'm really pleased to hear what she said because she was saying that supplements are important, but they're only something you add on. They are not the basis of how you treat the condition of PCOS. And, and I'm going to say that too. Medications can be helpful, but it's not the basis of how you solve a problem, right? You need to solve the problem by dealing with whatever is at the source of the problem. And if weight is part of it, um, whether you're PCO or not, the way to solve it is diet and exercise. So make sure you're eating six meals a day. Keep your calories low. Like Corey said, take protein with your carbs. Keep your carbs low. You want to focus on protein, focus on fiber. And then make sure that you are exercising to raise, number one, your metabolic rate. Number two, your muscle mass. Because the more muscle you have, the more calories it burns. So you can naturally keep your calorie count higher and stay just as lean. And by exercising you're burning off all the extra calories so that you're actually losing the weight directly so there is a lot that comes from having appropriate diet um, and and healthy eating habits as well as the exercise component and that's the way to solve things do you want me to ask the question sure, here sure. so first of all amanda hello best friend back uh, um, uh, from Jessica, hi, Dr. V, what is the likelihood of success for FET of a 4AA embryo for a 27-year-old female? Um, it would highly depend on whether or not the embryo is genetically normal. At your age, it should be probably one out of every, um, somewhere between one out of every uh, five to one out of every four embryos would be normal. So um, if you have a good FET protocol, like a letrozole or a natural, don't use the STEM protocol. It's the lowest success. You should be looking at somewhere around the 70 to 80% chance of success if it's genetically normal in the hands of a top-notch embryologist, physician, nursing team. Um, not so top-notch, 50-50. Yeah, so those are reasonable numbers. How long before trying to conceive as a man with my wife, I should start using HCG to improve my low T and bad semen? Um, if you have low T and bad semen, I wouldn't wait because you naturally want your testosterone levels high as a male. Um, and if you take testosterone to raise your, uh, your testosterone levels, you'll stop making sperm. It's like highly effective male birth control. So HCG helps you naturally get your testosterone level high and produce extra sperm. So I wouldn't wait at all. I would see, I would definitely seek the help of a physician. Don't be doing it on your own. But if you know that the sperm quality is bad and your testosterone is low, I would strongly advise you to seek out help. Yeah, absolutely. It wouldn't make sense not to actually. Hello, my two, my favorite two beautiful humans. That's us. Yeah. Uh, in your experience at VRC, does implantation failures in endo patients mostly happen because of pure quality embryos or poor endometrium receptivity? Will donor egg or donor embryos help endo patients get pregnant faster if they choose not to go the surgery route or oral meds route? Oh. Uh, okay, so PCOS um, 
has a whole litany, sorry, not PCOS, endo, has a whole litany of um, things that need to go with it. So first of all, we know that the egg quality and the embryo quality is hampered um, in patients with, PC, uh, with endo. We know that your endometrium and your immune system is overactive and somewhat unfriendly to the implantation of the embryo. So all of those things need to be addressed from before you even make your embryos. So you want a low estrogen stim. So we include letrozole in those stims. You want to make sure that you're using things like double trigger to maximize the chances of getting the best quality eggs. You don't want to stimulate for too long. That's just building up higher estrogen levels and inflaming the endo. Um, you don't want to get too high a dose of meds. It's better to get lower number of eggs, but get better quality than get 20 eggs that are crappy quality. Um, so that's just the egg part of things. From the standpoint of the uterus, um, I do strongly advocate for surgery. I don't believe people should skimp on the surgery. I think it can be very, very helpful. And the data is very clearly there to support that from actually a Canadian study called the Endocan study. From the standpoint of the protocol, we do suppress for three months with Lupron and Letrozole first, and then we use a Letrozole protocol for the stim for the embryo implantation. And then if you watched our show about two months, I think it was two months ago, on um, the right dose of progesterone for endo patients, higher doses of progesterone are beneficial for endo patients, way higher than normal, like 50% higher. So we now drive up our progesterone levels based on that study as well to get better receptivity for those patients. Um, if you've tried everything and you've exhausted the ability to use your own um, embryos uh, in your uterus, so your best option, uh, and I'm speaking just medically here, right, would be to take um, either donor egg uh, and put it into you or use your embryo and put it into a surrogate. So if you're making donor egg embryos um, with your partner's sperm and then you're putting those into you, that can be helpful because you're at least eliminating the initial impact on the egg quality. Um, but really the biggest impact is actually the uterus itself. So using your embryo in someone else will likely yield you a higher benefit than anything else in you would. Um, that's not to say you don't deserve the chance to try. If you want to try, try a protocol that is custom designed for someone with endo. If your facility does not have their own endo specific protocol, then they're just practicing cookie cutter medicine and that just does not work for endo patients. So I would focus a lot on that. That's a great question, by the way. Good evening, rock stars. Oh, hey. That's awesome. Do you do testosterone do farming guitar? for a natural cycle IVF? No. Testosterone priming for natural cycle IVF wouldn't make any sense because with natural cycle IVF, you're only going for one egg. And with testosterone priming, you're trying to increase the number of eggs that you're getting. So I would never put those two together. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Dr. V. Do you recommend PGTA <laughs> testing for male factors and 32-year-old woman to failed fresh transfer? Oh. Um, two failed fresh transfers? Why'd she have two fresh? That doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, if you failed two transfers, yes, I would probably say it's reasonable. Um, there is some support for the idea that if you have significant male factor, PGTA may be helpful. Listen, we talk about this on every show. The PGA, PGTA, um, you know, uh, jury is still out. We don't know. No one knows. It's so muddled, I can't even figure it out anymore. The experts don't even agree on this. There are experts publishing that it should never be done. It's still research only. Um, I was just in the UK. They were saying it's still experimental. Um, the, the HFEA, which is the governing body for fertility in the UK says, you actually have to justify the use when you're doing it for a patient. You cannot just go ahead and do it. You have to have them sign all these consent forms saying it's experimental, there's no evidence. So an entire very advanced developed nation is telling people that this is basically useless right now because they don't have any proof that it's beneficial. Um, whereas in the States, I mean, everybody's doing PGTA for everything. 
because they think it's better. So it's very hard to know. So uh, I don't think we have an answer yet. And, and I'm not sure when we will. Um, I'm not aware of any studies being done that are the proper kind of study. The last one that was done, which showed that there was no benefit, was horribly poorly designed. And um, a very famous RE by the name of Richard Scott um, actually wrote a letter about it, just shredding it, saying this study was designed to demonstrate that there was no benefit um, from the get-go. It was impossible to show a difference. And he was right. So, uh, yeah, I don't think we have a good study yet. I don't know why they haven't done one, but we don't have it yet. Love the live feeds that you do, Dr. V. So helpful. Thank you for everything. <clears throat> My pleasure. V and T, you guys are the best. I've watched your video on embryo math and oh, now cool. have a better understanding of my odds of success at 42. What are some factors that give 42 year olds produce more employed eggs? A healthy diet, um, lots of vitamins, um, good quality sperm, no smoking, no drinking, no drug use. Um, those are huge. Um, keep your weight down. Um, realistically though, you can't change the genetics of your eggs, but there may be something to the fact that when the sperm and the egg meet, um, the better the quality of everything, the higher the chances that if there is an abnormality, they can correct it because they can't actually correct abnormalities. And we know that. So, um, I would focus on just healthy living, making sure the sperm is good, making sure you're as healthy as you possibly can be. And thanks for all the nice comments. Great guest, Dr. VNT. She's awesome, eh? Yeah, she was good. Yeah, she was she's really good. good. Yeah. 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 How early should you take a urine pregnancy test after a five day transfer? I <laughs> tested at six days past and it was negative. Is that way too early? Yes, that is way too early. Do not test that early. Please, please, please. I know it's horrible and I know it's a lot to ask. But just wait the 14 days. Wait until we do your beta because everything else is inaccurate. No one should be testing after six days. And then you just get flustered and you get anxious and then your anxiety causes stress and then your stress can actually interfere with the success rate. So don't do that. Just wait. Go find things you love doing, whether it's walking or gently exercising or crafts or whatever, you know, making Lego. It doesn't matter. Do whatever you like. Just find something that you enjoy that keeps you calm because that's the best way to do it. With a 4AA embryo, yeah. what is the likelihood of success on the first time FET for 27 year old? She female? asked us that. Oh. She asked us on TikTok. Oh, I see. You're not getting TikTok on there. No, anymore, no, no, right? TikTok's not on here. Yeah, we answered that. That was Jessica. That is Jessica, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't, uh, for those of you that are watching and are new, don't jump to different platforms. We'll answer your questions as best as we can, but stick to one because otherwise we just end up repeating the question. And then I get in trouble. Well, I've never gotten you in trouble. Well, they get angry. <laughs> oh, they get it. Yeah. You get angry at them. Yeah. And feel free, feel free to get angry at the guy. Yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, my daughter had HSG test good. Now third, round and Clomid, 150 <clears throat> milligrams. Who would you recommend in Chicago? Oh, Absolutely a slam dunk, no brainer, Eve Feinberg. Eve Feinberg's at Northwestern and is probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. I love her to bits. Um, she's amazing, you can go see her. Um, Ruhi Jilani is also in Chicago, although now she's half time in Michigan and half time in Chicago. You could reach out to her as well, she's good. Um, but Eve is just like a whole other level of brilliant. Um, I think I'm dumb compared to Eve. So uh, yeah, Eve Feinberg, amazing doctor, long wait list, but she's the best of the best of the best. Hi, superstars V and T. <clears throat> yes. What foods like are best to eat before you're transferred? Do you have any recommendations also what not to eat? Yeah, so the Mediterranean diet has actually been shown to be beneficial. <clears throat> Excuse me, so um, grains, uh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, lean meat, um, fish and stuff like that. So uh, that is beneficial. So stick to that. And if you type in Mediterranean diet into Google, you'll see what they want you to eat. 
Um, so that's what you should have. What shouldn't you have? High sugar, high cholesterol. Those things are inflammatory, so um, don't do that. We have a important TikTok question. Oh, sure. From a man, I think that's Amanda, right? It's like A1 Manda. Is that what that is? Mm, I'm I not sure. Super anxious about egg retrieval. Any tips for how to share this with nursing staff prior to procedure? Yeah, tell us that you're anxious. In fact, tell us even before you come because they can pre-medicate you before you show up with some Ativan. So first of all, don't be super anxious. All of us have done this a million times. We're super comfortable doing it. Um, we're generally speaking all experts. Um, I know the difference between a follicle and your blood vessels, which is the most important part of an egg retrieval. We know how to position things. We know how to keep you comfortable. So if you're seeing someone that's an expert, you're going to have a, a good procedure and you don't need to be worried at all. Um, so that's number one. Number two, communicate. If you're anxious about something, tell your staff and we will help you out. Um, and just be open about it. Sam, I'm really super nervous and we'll try and lighten the mood. We crack jokes. We make, you know, we try and make it a little more calming for you. You can get pre-medicated. Um, there's all sorts of different options for you to make it a, a better experience. Yeah. Who would you recommend as a hormone specialist expert in perimenopause menopause in your area? Um, that's RN4. I remember you from last time. Hi, RN4. Uh, yeah, I guess myself or Dr. Pattinson, um, we would both be the experts for that. Anyone with reproductive endocrinology is not just fertility, we're any hormone related topic. So menopause, perimenopause is our area of expertise too. So just get a referral and I'll be happy to see you and tell them that I said it was okay. This was asked. Um, okay. Oh, you're picking it up? You go, man. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Cause, cause it, I was ready for that one. All right. It was asked here. It was re-asked here. I got it. Yeah. How to counteract bad morphology from versatile without surgery? I already have done two. Oh, from varicocele. Varicocele lectomies. Yeah. Um, vitamins, antioxidants, avoid heat, no smoking, no drinking, no drug use. And by no, I mean none, like zero. Um, ejaculate frequently, keep your testicles cold. All of those will work. All right. Uh, hi, Dr. V. What are your thoughts on long protocol for own egg IVF for someone with POI? Does King protocol equal increased risk of cancer? Thanks. King? K-I-N-G? I don't know what a K-I-N-G protocol is. Uh, yeah, long protocol for someone with premature ovarian insufficiency um, would be maniacal. No one would or should do that. That just doesn't make sense. Um, if you're suppressed, you're going to make even less eggs. And the long protocol is literally suppression. So the long protocol is not common anymore for sure. Um, I'm sure there are still some people using it, but... For the most part, very few people are doing the long protocol anymore. Um, so I would avoid that one, uh, you know, kind of as much as possible. Most people are using um, antagonist protocols or a microdose flare protocol. Very few people are using um, the long protocol still. So I would avoid that. As far as the King protocol, I'm not aware of that. Having said that, um, uh, IVF protocols have been studied uh, more than I could ever imagine. And it has been looked at in terms of its cancer risk. There is no cancer risk. So you don't need to worry about that. There's no cancer risk from doing IVF. Zero. I tested on day on 10 days after my FET with a 4AA embryo. Yeah. And the test was <clears> negative. <throat> what would my next steps be? What test would you recommend? I only have one embryo left. Oh, boy. Uh, I would need to talk to you. You're not giving me nearly enough information. I need to know your age. I need to know your BMI. I need to know your social habits. I need to know your partner's social habits. I need to know if the embryo is genetically tested. I need to know what testing you've done. I need to know what protocol they use for you. So um, it's not a, a snap answer. I, you got to get a consult for an answer like that. That's important. 
I know in Canada, sex selection, sex selection is illegal. Yeah. But. Very illegal. But. <laughs> what are your thoughts on it? Do you think sex selection can be a bad thing? Whoa, they're asking me the moral question. We don't get asked a lot of moral we're questions on deep. this show. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm a really religious person. So is Tarek, by the way. Um, I can say that on his behalf. Uh, we're not the same religion, but we both respect the same God. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't believe people should do sex selection. I think that it's entirely reasonable to just let you get whatever um, God or Mother Nature or whatever the universe, if you want to call it that, is giving you. Um, I get it, kind of, if you have three of one sex and you just really want one of the other, which we call family balancing. Um, but again, like whatever nature wants to give you, let it give you. So I'm not a big proponent of sex selection. Yeah, genetic reasons. Okay, I get it. You know, you've got you got to screen out some kind of fatal disease or, or harmful disease. Sure, but aside from that, just because you know I wanted a baby girl or a baby boy for my first baby, that doesn't make sense. You. Oh, let it roll the dice, man. You'd say roll the dice. Roll the dice. Yeah, every time. Um, well, if you had like 20 boys in a row. Okay, I don't think anyone's going to get 20 boys. Then maybe a girl would be a nice... <laughs> what, nice what's change. what's your rational cutoff? 20 is a little extreme, man. Even I would say 20 is well, a lot. you know... Because the I'll, mother would be dead. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's a high rate of that. Yeah. Or I'd be dead, quite honestly. <laughs> right? I could easily be killed at that yeah, point. Yeah, you would be killed. You'd be overrun, yeah. yeah Your wife would kill you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So what, what's a reasonable number? Well, you know, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been blessed to have a, a pretty decent... You've got a, a got good... A size. Right? You've got a size, got yeah. A size, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. And people were telling We're me, referring to his family. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. an important thing to indicate. That's not bad. This show has just went bonkers. <laughs> but on, on a serious note, on a serious, serious note, note, yeah. Uh, when I had my my last daughter, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, a lot of people were telling me not to have any more kids because I'll probably get a girl. Like I have like the girl curse. If okay, you will, that I'm getting way too many girls. Okay, no good. Sperm's weak. Right. Stop. Unless you want more girls, but the chances of you getting a boy are over. Right. And? I didn't obviously believe him. Like, I care. Like, a, you know, old wives' tales, superstitions. God knows right. where they're pulling this. And it all worked out. All worked out. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not a... Yeah. Yeah, um, nonsense. Yeah. I think if you've... If it was legal, it isn't. But if it was legal, for me, I could kind of understand if you had three... Hmm. You just really wanted to balance it out. Okay, I get it. But, but even, even if you had three, and then you balance it out and you get the one... It's not balanced. It's, it's, you're actually way off whack because right. that kid is—he's playing with girls all day every day. All day every day. Yeah. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm simply saying he doesn't have someone to actually play right. with. Right. So now you're looking so for then, another boy. Then you have to have right. another one. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 No. So I, yeah. I you guess. might as well just have the four girls and say, "Hey, they're all girls," or the four boys. I agree. That mix up in the middle. Of, I, then you got to have more. I totally agree. And hey, I'm all for having. One. I don't mind. <laughs> That's but then we go back to the wife then killing you. Yeah, then I'm dead. Yeah, I'm dead again. All the answers point to me dying somehow. That's the situation. Yeah, that's good to know. If you don't see me later on this week. Then I know your wife's then pregnant. Then I know my wife is watching. She said, he's dead. And therefore I died. Yeah. That was a nice little... That's the same way. That was... That's some pretty serious banter. <laughs> that was good, yep. Um, okay. Um, can I exercise during stimulation for IVF? You can exercise during stimulation for IVF, but don't do anything too extreme. Remember, if you're doing extreme stuff, the blood flow is going to your muscles and not to your ovaries, and we want them going to your ovaries. And also, if you do a lot of bouncing up and down kind of stuff, the other problem you run into is you could twist your ovary. If you twist your ovary, you're going to do a lot of damage. The ovary won't work as well. Um, it's now torted. You're going to need emergency surgery. Your whole cycle is canceled. It's a nightmare. So don't do that. That would be bad. Between Very bad. laughter at the end of our... I just want to scroll down to see if people enjoyed this little bit here. Yeah. 
A lot of RIPTs. <laughs> That's it. At this point, it's over for me. It was, it was a pleasure to know you all. That's awesome. I love it. Oh, very creative audience we have. I love that. That's great. Uh, hi, favorite duo. I have DOR. I'm embryo banking after two successful rounds of microdose Lupron. Seven oh, good. eggs retrieved each time. Amazing. Good I job. suddenly stop responding on the third round. Oh. Why is that? And what can I do? Um, I don't know why. Um, I don't think anyone will be able to answer why. Make sure you weren't taking birth control first or some kind of priming before that. If you were priming, make sure it's DHEA or testosterone or human growth hormone because those ones do not suppress. Uh, what can you do? Prime with those. Um, try PRP. Um, see a naturopath. Uh, those would basically be it. There aren't a whole lot of options there. But wait another month. You know, Just see what happens with your hormones. Or try, you, try a luteal phase too. That might also work sometimes. How do you get an appointment with you? Oh, easy. Contact info at drvictory.com. So if you contact info at drvictory.com, request uh, an appointment and we will set that up. Um, if you're uh, in Ontario, you can just ask for a referral and um, go through that pathway as well. Um, we do have a bit of a wait list because we've grown immensely and it's just me. But um, we're doing our best, so. Yeah. I occasionally walk the hallways wearing a lab coat. <laughs> yeah, but we're not going to let you do well, any consults that. anytime yeah, yeah, yeah. soon. Yeah. Uh, this is probably really uncommon. Is there a risk for using <clears throat> embryos that have been frozen for 25 years? Um, is there a risk? No, not at all. Um, will it work? So it's confusing. Um, they recently had uh, news about uh, an embryo set, I think it was a pair of embryos, that had been frozen for 30 years, and it still worked. Um, the major issue is that there are some studies that say that the longer the embryos are frozen, the less chance of success. So your only risk is that it may not work, but there's no risk to the babies or you from using them. So you can go ahead and try. A lot of people asking about success rates, so I'm going to just read them and you, and you can like rapid fire these ones. Yeah, I can rapid fire success rate. Success rate questions, guys, are impossible to answer because I need to know so much about you, right? It's, it's not like I can say, oh, you're 35, you weigh 120 pounds, you, you don't, don't smoke or drink. Easy. Yeah, no, I that. know. Even if you gave me that, I, I need like lots of information about you. What did you do before? How many times did you try? Did you try IUI? What's your diagnosis? Have they done this test? Have they done, like, I can't answer success questions. It's impossible. I can answer factual questions. What happens with this med? What happens with that med? But I cannot answer success questions. It's impossible without knowing all sorts of detail about you. If you want me to answer success questions, I'm happy to, but, big but, you have to get a consult so I can get to know everything about you. And then I can gauge it. And keep in mind, it's still just a gauge. If you want a rough idea of your success rates, watch embryo math. We're just about to hit 100,000 soon, I saw that. Eh? I saw that. I'm thinking like two weeks, maybe? Two or three weeks? It'll it's be happening. our first video over 100. And then that vitamin one, that's gone crazy Starlight. too. I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Um, my friend is 7'3". Healthy and active, but why he gets... Like 7'3"? Yeah. Well, like 7 yeah. apostrophe 3? Mm -hmm, Whoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a tall dude. But why does he get injuries every time? I just read them. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, injuries every time. I have no idea what that means. So, yeah. Sexually, I have no oh, clue. I, I, don't I, I do not I know. know where these injuries are. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea you what these mean. You can just walk into a tree and just, you know, <laughs> tall guy or gal. Yeah, I got, I got no ideas. Next. Uh, what are your opinions <laughs> on heating pads and caffeine pre and post ovulation? Thank you. Um, Caffeine, one cup a day is fine. Uh, more than that is a risk of miscarriage. Heating pads are fine as long as they're not the electric ones because the electric ones emit electromagnetic radiation, so you want to avoid that. Hi, Dr. V, and super T. Super T. I'm taking metformin. Should I also be taking inositol? I used to have insulin resistance, history of several early pregnancy <clears throat> losses. Should I supplement with B12 while metformin? 
Um, yes to all of those. Yes, you should be on an Ostol. Yes, it's good to take B12. Um, and if you're suffering from insulin resistance, make sure you're eating six meals a day. Make sure you're keeping your calories low. And make sure you're exercising. All of that's really important. Should they be calling you Super R.I.P.T. <laughs> or just Super T? <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I show up next week. Okay. I'll be honest. I, I would like to be here. <laughs> I would like you to be here too. Yeah. I'd like to be here. It'd be nice. Yeah. It'd be yeah. nice. So if I survive this. I'm going to need you to pick up my car again, man. So oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey. I know. I know. You'd be there for that one. Yeah. yeah. Hi, T and Dr. V. Could you explain in detail? Uh -oh. The low dose Lupron protocol for egg retrieval. Do you use letrozole and for how long do you prime using testosterone? Uh, we prime for two weeks. I've seen everything from six weeks till, um, till one week before. So we do two weeks before you start your stim for the testosterone. Um, in detail, so you need to take micro doses of Lupron, which is usually 20 units twice a day. Um, and you are, uh, some people use 40, but most people use 20. And then um, you can take that starting one day before, and then you start your meds the day after. And so that's usually like a day two Lupron, day three, start your going left, Menopure, whatever you're going to use. Um, and then stim and just stay on the microdose Lupron until you're ready to trigger. We still use a GnRH agonist trigger. Um, in addition to a medium dose of HCG. So like 3,000, 5,000, 3,500, something in that range. What is the normal fertility rate for ICSI? I had my third egg retrieval with 25 eggs retrieved, 19 matured, but only eight fertilized. What might be the possible reason? Like sperm selection techniques, lab? Yeah, so listen, there's an insane amount of variation in ICSI success rates. Some labs and some embryologists are getting 50%. Um, some are getting 95%. That's us. Um, and there's everything in between. So uh, it would most likely be the lab. Um, it could be the sperm quality. We almost never get low fertilization here though even when we have terrible sperm we still get good fertilization you may not always get great embryos with bad sperm but we almost always get fertilization so it would be rare for us to have less than at a minimum like 85 percent fertilization um and normally it's like 90 95 100 yeah so it's probably the lab meaning the technician the equipment the supplies the prep all of that stuff most likely I wasn't there, I don't know your case, but um, usually it's gonna be that stuff. I love your facial expressions. I can measure that something bad is coming my way. <laughs> it's not necessarily bad. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's really, it, Out I'll, there? Read it. I'll read it for you. <laughs> okay. Do people fart when they are out for the egg retrieval? LOL, my biggest fear. No, no one farts when they're out for their egg retrieval, so don't worry about that. Was my facial reaction justifiable? It was, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. No, I've never had someone fart. I have been peed on during an embryo transfer, um, but I've never had someone fart. That's interesting. Yeah. You guys are so much fun. Sure wish I can get my daughter to you. Your thoughts on Clomid 150 milligrams? Oh, well, it depends on what the diagnosis is. Clomid for 150 milligrams is great, but what are you treating? Unexplained infertility, useless alone. It won't help you. Um, PCOS, letrozole is better. So it depends on what we're treating. Yeah, it's not like a super high dose, um, but, you know, it's doable. Oh, that was Carly's question. <laughs> um, you were fine. Don't worry. Uh, hi, Dr. VNT. My third IVF was canceled last month and I haven't gotten my period. My clinic prescribed PIO to trigger a period. Does this actually work? PIO? Oh my God, just take 10 days of progesterone pills. Why would you inject yourself? That's, that's insane. That's crazy. Yeah, it does work. It'll start a period. Um, but first, before you do anything, please check and make sure you're not pregnant. Get your hormones checked. Then figure out if you need to take the progesterone. And if you do, then you take it. Yeah.
and take it oral. Don't be doing it injectable. That's crazy. <laughs> where, where do you want estrogen LH progesterone for transfer? Um, so LH for me, I like low because I don't want my patients to surge. Progesterone depends on which units you're using, but in our units, you want between 60, uh, sorry, 40 and 100, unless they have endo and then it should be much higher. Um, estrogen, you want low. I don't focus too much on estrogen levels. I just don't want them getting super high. And uh, what was the other one? Was that it? There was three things. Yeah, I got them all. Okay. LH, to, uh, progesterone, and estrogen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there such a thing as too much progesterone suppositories and cream yep. were suggested to me? Yep. Yeah, if you overdo it, you're taking birth control, so don't overdo it. You can't have too much. Can you do PGTA embryos frozen from 25 years ago, or is it too late in their development? If you're asking me if I can do PGTA on embryos that were frozen 25 years ago, the answer is possibly. 25 years ago, you probably did not have blastocysts. You probably had day three embryos. Um, and so they can be grown till day five and then biopsied. The problem is you froze your embryos once and now you're gonna thaw them, grow them, biopsy them, refreeze them, and then have to rethaw them again when you get your biopsy results. So uh, it's a good question. In fact, I had that discussion with a, a patient today, similar, it wasn't day three embryos, um, but it's complicated. There's a lot of different variations of that. How many embryos do you thaw? Do you thaw them all at once? Do you just do a couple at a time? Um, do you try a fresh transfer and do the PGT at the same time and then wait for the results to consider termination if they're not good or do you refreeze? So there's a lot of variations to that question. It's a great question, but it, it's like a half hour discussion on the phone. And I, I literally had that exact discussion today. Should older 41-year-old patients with DOR do a dual trigger? Everyone should do a dual trigger. Clinically proven to be beneficial. It is absurd to argue against it. Everyone should have a dual trigger. <laughs> I love your expressions. You can never, thank God you're Muslim and you can't gamble, because, and I don't either, but you would never be able to have a yeah, poker. but then I'm in the zone. I know. I gotta hide my reaction. <laughs> no, dude. I feel I'm allowed to you give you the heads not, up. It's you my could... subtle way to warn you that something's afoot. <laughs> you would have the worst poker face ever. I would slaughter a poker. <laughs> I would be like a billionaire. That's the only problem. I'm not uh, in the casino. No. That's what's stopping me. <laughs> no, dude. They say always, what is it? The house always wins? Yeah. My house. You'd be the house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, that'd be our wives too. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Does cycling help with the calf and belly fat? Um, well, no exercise targets a specific region of fat. You don't burn more fat in one area because you're working on that area. You store fat in uh, your body. And when your body runs out of energy, then it turns to burning the fat, but it does it everywhere. It's not like target specific. So if you're doing 800 sit-ups, your stomach muscles are gonna get tight. And yeah, sure, you're gonna lose some weight, so it'll start to show more. But if your belly is still chubby, you're still gonna have fat there. So um, it, it's systemic, it's not in one place. That's what I tell my kids, that I have like an eight pack underneath <laughs> my belly fat. An eight pack, not just the six yeah, pack. Yeah, who's wasting time with six? <laughs> Let's go all the way to yeah, eight. Yeah, all eight. the way to eight. That's my move. Yeah. Uh, how long? How long to have a transfer after IVF and hyperstimulation? OHHS. OHSS. Uh, two months. Uh, hi, Doctor V. Should you take both PIO and progesterone suppositories for a fresh transfer cycle? Yes. My doctor only prescribed the suppositories. Thank you. It's always better to have both. But. You got to be super careful in a fresh because the PIO is going to shoot up your progesterone levels. You don't want to overshoot. So um, be cautious with that because your body's going to be producing a lot of progesterone. When do I give up if I have had three biochemicals with all tests unexplained? 
Um, listen, I'm in no position to tell someone I barely know when to give up. So uh, I would never even think of offering an answer to that. However, I will tell you that in many cases, um, uh, we are able to figure out why you're having trouble um, and solve it. So just reach out to us and we'll help you. What kind of IVF protocol would you use for someone with small fibroids? I have had three fails with estradiol and progesterone suppositories and shots. I think it's not the right meds for me. Well, we're against doing the stimulated protocols like that. So if you're looking at doing things like um, estrogen and then progesterone, we don't recommend that. We use letrozole or if you don't want to use letrozole, do a natural. I guess my big question for you would be, a, how big are the fibroids? B, exactly where in your uterus are the fibroids? And C, um, if you've already failed twice, is there something else going on? So we kind of attack the whole thing. We don't just deal with one, one little issue. What kind of IVF, uh, if I had lots of fibroids removed, creating lots of scar tissues, not yet to mention oh. I'm 40 with both tubes being blocked? What kind of IVF? Mm. I mean, there's only one kind of IVF. You do egg retrieval, whether you do ICSI or not is a different story. Um, but if you have scarring in your uterus, before you make embryos, make sure that they've settled the scarring so that you know if it's reasonable for you as far as whether or not it's possible to get you pregnant. There are some uteruses that are badly damaged and we can't, we need to use a surrogate. So I would have thorough evaluation of your uterus first before you do anything else. Are there still tons of questions? Um, tons, let me see. Yeah, there, there's, yeah there's, <laughs> there's, there's a scrollable amount. All right. Dr. V, have you ever had trouble getting to a follicle that is tucked underneath a major artery and uterus on the left side. Um, have I ever had trouble getting to follicles, period? Yes, of course. Um, sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's not safe. So there are follicles I will not try for because the ovary is bouncy and it's moving away. You will never have a follicle that's tucked. Well, I shouldn't say never. You will likely be able to work around blood vessels as far as um, getting to a, a follicle. Not always, but usually. Um, but ovaries don't generally tuck behind blood vessels unless you have this thing they call the nutcracker syndrome where you basically have like varicose veins around your ovary. It does a lot of damage to the ovary. It typically weakens it prematurely. And those ones you cannot touch. Like you'll kill the patient if you go for them. So um, those ones I would never even try. Where do you want estrogen LH progesterone for okay, yes, that. That, yeah. uh, Is it okay to continue taking melatonin after depolupron injection? Mm -hmm. No association. They're they're not linked together. Yeah. Just finished day six stims. Okay. Been so fortunate to have you and the VRC in our corner. Oh, thank you. Yay. Big muscle flex. Big muscle flex. <laughs> What's the success rate on lower graded embryos to AA slash BB created from someone under 30? Um, I guess I'd ask why they're two. Two AA, two BB, those are good embryos, but they're still compacted. So I, I'd want to know why they didn't wait until they were expanding. Um, I mean, in theory, you're young, you got like nice quality embryos, they're just not fully expanded that should still yield a very good chance is medicated iui recommended for all iuis no matter your age egg condition ovulation etc no you can do iui without doing meds we do that all the time natural cycle iui um, we add in the meds to improve your chances but that's the only reason does embryo glue make a difference with fully hatched embryos yes yeah so Years ago, we reviewed embryo glue. We should probably do another one on that. Um, it does make a difference. Yeah, embryo glue can help. If you have an AFC of three or four, yeah. do you recommend just pills or injections? Clomid and letrozole together 
low dose injections, combination of both, over 40, and AMH is 0.5. Ooh. Um, so as far as we understand it, your best protocol is to use uh, letrozole in conjunction with injection medications. That appears to give you the best chance of success. Not super high doses of injections because even with lower doses, you're going to make the same number of eggs. So medium doses of meds for the injectables and letrozole um, priming might help you as well. Can melatonin prevent ovulation? Not that I've ever heard of. Follow up to the DT question above. If you have an AFC of three, yeah, we did that. So, so that's dual the fault. trigger, yeah. even with natural IVF? Yeah, because it still increases the chances of getting a mature follicle that will result in a good quality embryo. Do you recommend a hotel for us to stay at when we come for retrieval in February? Well, most people like staying at the casino because it's big and fun and loud and, um, you know, there's good restaurants and stuff like that there. Um, there's lots of good hotels here. So um, any of them down by the waterfront are quite nice. Um, there's a nice Holiday Inn very close to us. It's brand new. It's very clean. Um, I stayed there myself when I came back from Europe because I had uh, covid um, this is back in the summer and my son was studying for his bar exam and wouldn't let me home. So I was stuck there for about 10 days. So yeah, it's a nice hotel. It's got a good breakfast. The eggs need some work. They were like that. Hotel well, eggs are rubber. always a little bit. It's like that rubbery stuff. Oh, yeah. It was not good. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do a live talking about fertilisis? Sorry if you've already done one and I missed it. Um, yeah, we should invite, he's got a strong accent, but we could invite Panagiotis on. Sure, let me talk to the guy from Fertilis. The problem is the time, diff oh, it wouldn't be live unless we did it on the weekend. He's seven, six or seven hours ahead in Greece. Mm. Let me see what I can do for you. Um, short answer, Fertilis is a company. It has a whole bank of tests. And the tests are uh, immune, infectious, male stuff, female stuff, antioxidant damage, which reminds me we're going to get a cool new machine to check some stuff out with regards to oxidative and reductive stress. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a great company. They have a lot of various options available. Um, he does speak fluent English. I just would need to figure out the timing. We'd have to do it on like a weekend. It'd probably be great. He'd love it. Yeah, let me see what I can do. I'll I'll see if I can set something up somehow. Hey, they're saying they aren't egg pros like you at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> Not bad, eh? I love of, that. They got jokes on here today. I like that. That's very good. Um, do you recommend a... Oh, yeah. Uh, can you do... Oh, we did that. I was looking for that too today. I was looking for a hotel to come over here. This oh, is, uh, hey. Very nice. That's good. Um, okay. Let me hold the more on. the merrier. We are we are very welcoming. We have people coming from all over the world. So, is it running? Yeah, it's running. Okay. Um, thank you, Doctor VNT, for the split dual stem fol follicular stem. Oh, and cool. Egg retrieval, then wait for a period, then do a luteal phase stem. Really appreciate you guys. No problem. Um. If I want to do a fresh transfer and I don't want lining to thin out, yeah. should I not only take Clomid five to seven days or Letrozole in place or neither just increase injectables? Clomid has been shown to thin your lining because it is anti-estrogenic in your uterus. Letrozole does not. So you could just take Letrozole. That would be fine. It is, in my opinion, the last question. Okay. We caught them all up. That's good because yeah, it's. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Week away from transfer. Yeah. What vitamins should I be taking, and can I take melatonin? You should take melatonin because it increases your chances. You're still. Yeah, and then you should also take vitamin D, uh, the fish oils. Um, uh, make sure you're taking a prenatal vitamin. Um, if your iron's low, make sure you get that checked. Take some iron, B12. 
Um, but the main ones are your prenatal, your vitamin D, uh, your fish oils, and melatonin. Those are the four vitamins that will help you with your FET. One more from Australia. They just oh, from Australia. Yeah, like this. Yeah, of course. There's mm. a lot of effort from mm. Australia here. Okay, one for down under. What type of planning would I need if I wanted to come and do an IVF cycle with you? What kind of planning? Hmm. Uh, we just need to do a consult with you and then um, figure out your monitoring and that's about it. So um, we can monitor you there and then you can just come here for your retrieval or we can monitor you here if you come and stay with us for a couple of weeks. We just need to talk to you about what specifically you need because we customize for every single patient. Done? Yeah, I just want to make sure that was correct with the split duo stim. Split duo stim? Yeah. You're good with that one? Well, she just said. Yeah, she just wanted to It was to just sure a you thank you. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that was correct with the split duo stim. Yeah, we do do a split duo stim. Yeah, I like split duo stim. I think it makes more sense than normal duo stim. One more, <laughs> one more, one more. Hey, T, please this is your read my third, last question. This is your Here's third. my last, last question. Okay. Last, last. All right. All right. Do you recommend fertilisis if you are doing just egg retrievals and not transfer? No. I don't, if it's important no. to do it, just to do it for the egg retrieval. No, absolutely not. Unnecessary and you could change between now and the time that you do your transfer. So skip that. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much again to Corey Ruth for joining us tonight. Um, next week, I believe we have Dr. Fred Zineku joining us. Um, he's an amazing reproductive endocrinologist and immunologist. So if you have recurrent pregnancy loss, if you've got immunological problems, he's my go-to guy. I love him dearly and he's a buddy. Um, so we're going to have him on. He is with Tripod Fertility in Toronto, a fantastic resource and center there. Um, so we're going to talk to Fred and I think we have someone else coming on. Oh, uh, we're going to have Faye Weisberg on the show as well. So, uh, I've got a whole lineup of visiting guests for a while. Cause every time I look for good new studies, there are literally zero. There's nothing good out recently. So we'll be in touch soon. Um, so we'll have some folks on the show, bring your questions. You can ask them. And, uh, as always, if you need us or we can be of service, don't hesitate to reach out. Make sure you give us comments and likes and, um, share with your friends. So if you're on TikTok, if you're on Instagram, if you're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, any of the platforms we're on, even when you jump on, just send a message to your friends and say, hey, I'm watching this, come check it out. Um, check out our videos on things like, are your heavy periods normal? We're gonna be doing more content on just normal stuff that's not necessarily fertility, just well women care. Have a great night, guys. We'll see you again next